All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's solution session hosted by ERS. My name is Bernie Hayoski. I'm with the Enterprise Planning Office. And with us today are representatives from Cobera Health uh, to present on its services related to healthcare cost management. Ground rules for today's solution session. Cobera Health will have up to 45 minutes to present uh, its products and services to us. And then following that, we will have a question and answer period from those in attendance. We are recording today's solution session, so please be sure to speak up when you ask a question. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Lena, and uh, we'll begin with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Covera Health, thank you so much for having us in today. Covera Health curates high-performance provider networks, and Frank and I work on the commercial side of the business. I'm a physician by training, and uh, Frank has actually been working in employee benefits for over 25 years. Uh, and most recently, we've worked at companies like Doctor on Demand and Castlight Health. So here's what we'd like to do today. We're going to be providing an overview of the crisis of healthcare waste in the U.S. We'll review the single most impactful program that employers can use to reduce waste and ensure that your members get the right care from the start. And then we also want to understand where the misdiagnosis crisis fits within the priority lists for ERS of Texas. One thing that became really clear to us as we were reviewing your 2018 annual report is that there was a, a theme that emerged that you offer excellent benefits to your members, but provided in a cost-effective manner. We felt like looking at your annual report that the objectives for your members and the state of Texas are clear, that you um, put together benefit programs that attract and retain a qualified workforce to serve the state, but doing it in a way where you get the most out of every dollar. So it was really there that we saw this theme emerge of excellent benefits <laughs> offered cost effectively. Now, um, Covera Health works and curates high performing providers to ensure high quality care and lower costs. And here's a, just a brief snapshot of really how we do this. We certify high performing providers. We provide ongoing quality monitoring and feedback to those providers. And then we really offer a guarantee for better outcomes and lower costs. And I'll be describing in more detail exactly how that works. So first, let's talk about the crisis of misdiagnoses in the US today. Nearly one third of healthcare spending is wasted in the US, and that equates to about $750 billion of healthcare spending. About half of that is attributable to inefficient delivery of care or the delivery of unnecessary care to patients. And this is really getting a lot of attention from leading uh, experts and, and uh, benefit executives uh, in the employer space. Here you have a quote from Lisa Woods um, from Walmart, who talks about 54% of Walmart associates who were told that they needed spine surgery and were then directed to a surgical center of excellence, learned later that actually they had the wrong diagnosis and could avoid surgery altogether. And unfortunately, the problem of misdiagnosis remains unappreciated in the US today, despite the fact that misdiagnosis affects 12 million Americans annually, and about 50% of those diagnoses may result in patient harm, and that errors due to diagnosis errors are twice as more deadly than errors due to some other reason. And there's a, um, a committee on diagnostic error in healthcare um, through the NIH that talks about how these errors are likely to worsen over time as the delivery of healthcare and the diagnostic process um, continues to increase in complexity over time. This is something that you've highlighted yourselves in your own annual report, talking about um, unnecessary services driving up costs. These are due to medical harm and waste. And what we had noticed was that misdiagnoses were previously a silent but really very devastating problem um, without a solution. And that was really what 
caused us to actually start uh, the company and the work that we're doing at Covera Health. So within misdiagnoses, let's talk about the role of er errors related to medical imaging. Um, medical imaging plays a critical diagnostic role in nearly every aspect of medicine, um, as you might imagine. About $100 billion is spent on medical imaging each year, and that number is growing. The utilization of radiology increased 70 percent between 2000 and 2009. And interestingly and unfortunately, nearly half of the malpractice claims that are paid out are due to diagnostic errors related to radiology. So if you're looking at the, the chart there, you'll see that it's about 50 percent uh, of these errors uh, and malpractice suits due to errors in radiology, with the top diagnoses being involved in those errors as breast cancer, lung cancer, and fracture. So again, this Committee on Diagnostic Error in Healthcare talks about how radiology is so foundational in clinical medicine, and having the wrong di diagnosis from the start can lead to unnecessary or harmful treatment and can certainly result in a lot of harm to patients. Now, you talk about how um, one of the major components of the costs uh, in your own program are due to a, an increase in utilization. And what we found is that radiology misutilization leads to misutilization of other costly healthcare services, such as surgery and specialty pharma. So we believe that addressing misdiagnoses in radiology will have a substantial impact on healthcare costs and outcomes. So I want to share with you kind of how we got started in this, um, in this area and how the company started. It, it really started with a very simple study, um, but eye-opening study that we conducted. Um, we took one patient, um, a 63-year-old woman, she had low back pain, and we sent her to 10 MRI centers within a certain geographic area. So she had essentially the same low back MRI conducted at each one of these centers within a span of about three weeks. And what came back to us was actually fairly shocking. If you look at all of the 10 reports from this study, it wasn't even clear looking at the reports that it was the same patient. It was the interpretation and the assessment from those tests were so different, it was even hard to believe it was the same person. There was an average of 43% diagnostic error rate. And if you look at the graph, what that really shows um, on the far right is that none of the centers, you know, if you take all of the findings that they, that they found, it was, it was a total of 49 findings, none of the centers could agree on one single finding. And so as a result, th this really represents that many people, due to radiology errors, may be receiving the wrong care. So here's an, an example from that study of how different the, some of these reports were. In one of the reports, the radiologist recommended that the patient be worked up for osteoporosis. In another report, the findings really suggested that, um, that the patient should actually be worked up for a surgical evaluation. So again, very, very different treatment paths and very different implications for the patient. Now, the response from providers that have um, seen and evaluated this study, which was, which was published in a peer-reviewed journal, um, you know, they talked about how the findings really confirmed what many in the radiology community have known uh, for many years. The challenges that they are finding is that they don't have the downstream feedback in order to make changes and address those errors in a systematic way. And, um, you know, they also acknowledged that while they knew that this was a problem in radiology, they never really suspected that the error rate was this high. Um, and they're asking the question, what can be done now? So let's talk for a little bit about the causes of these radiology errors. It really comes down to three different areas. The first is issues related to, um, on the technical side, due to uh, image quality. 
Second is related to lack of sub subspecialization with radiologists. And the third is a lack of feedback mechanisms. And I'll talk about each of these. So here, this is an example of two different, uh, two different quality uh, images of the same patient uh, done on two different mach machines with two different technicians. And on the left, what you'll see, if you look at the, at the red arrow, that's pointing to nerve roots. This is a patient with low back pain. And you can see the, um, the, the black dots in there, those represent nerve roots, which are really important to evaluate when someone complains of something like low back pain. Uh, and they're fairly clear to see uh, on the image on the, on the left. On the image on the right, you can see you can barely even make those out. So it would be nearly impossible for a radiologist to identify any issues associated with those nerve roots. Similarly, um, if you look at the blue arrow um, on the left image, uh, that uh, points to an image of, uh, of a kidney. And um, so kidney, the kidney can be the source of, of issues related to low back pain, so it's important to look at that structure. On the image on the, on the right, you can see you can barely even make out that that kidney exists, uh, much less being able to identify what issues um, there, that may actually uh, be occurring uh, with that organ. So strength and, and resolution of these images and the way that the patients are set up on these machines, it really varies from center to center. Here's another example. Um, on the image on the right, this is, uh, sorry, on the left, this is an example of a center that has really uh, an excellent protocol in assessing the full anatomical structures of the low back. And the white lines that you see there are, are what are called slices, slices of uh, that anatomical region um, that will allow the radiologist to assess everything in that area. There were 44 slices captured, and this was a, a, a test that took four, about 40 to 45 minutes to obtain. Now, by contrast, on the image on the right, uh, this protocol really only called for 20 images that are looking at the disk space only, and really kind of ignoring all the other uh, structures in that area. This only took 15 minutes to take, and it's something that more centers are doing now because of fee-for-service pressures. And so you can see the difference. A radiologist just would not be able to provide a full assessment of what is going on in that region um, with the image on the right. So those protocol differences, unfortunately, prioritize speed at the expense of anatomical coverage. Now let's talk about the issue of subspecialization. So within diagnostic radiology, there are many different modalities, everything from x-rays to MRIs um, to ultrasounds, as well as a range of anatomical regions that could be evaluated, right? Everything from the brain to the spinal cord to joints and blood vessels. And at some centers, radio some radiologists are asked to to cover all the modalities, bouncing from modality to modality, and from anatomical region to another. So it really becomes impossible for that person to be, be an expert in each one of those modalities and each one of those anatomical regions. So as a result, that lack of subspecialization leads to diagnostic errors. So then there's the issue of a lack of objective standards and monitoring and feedback, which really breeds poor quality medicine. These days, the, the healthcare system is really set up to treat radiology as a commodity, which incentivizes speed and volume over accuracy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have those fee-for-service pressures that um, really are leading these centers to prioritize speed and really getting done with these, image, these exams one after the other. And even if providers are invested in improving, there really, today, there are no objective data or standards to enable them and empower them to do that. So again, another comment from the Committee on Diagnostic Error in Healthcare, um, the more that we treat radiology as a commodity, as ancillary healthcare services, the more challenging it's going to be to improve accuracy of diagnosis.
So we've gotten a lot of um, really interesting and compelling feedback from um, self-insured employers that we've been speaking with. Some of them uh, know that this problem exists. They've seen it themselves, um, as did Lisa Woods at Walmart. One of the employers said that 25% of their surgical centers of excellence patients needed to be re-imaged. They talk about, um, you know, if a quality system is going to be put in place, it has to be ROI positive within year one and without disruption to the member journey, which is understandable. And then they're aware of other radiology networks that really prioritize unit cost, but that no one else really has the data and the infrastructure to be able to demonstrate savings based on the quality that's being delivered. So at Covera Health, we are pioneering those objective measures to define, measure, and deliver high quality care. And so while we're, we're actually fairly um, and relatively new to the uh, employee benefits space, the company has actually been around for a while. We, we took seven years to access some pretty um, unique, a unique set of data uh, based on medical records and the actual uh, radiology images themselves to develop our statistical modeling and our, our algorithms. By the end of the year, we'll have over 1,500 high-quality centers in our network of excellence. Uh, we currently cover over 1 million lives. Uh, and in fact, uh, just today, we released news of our collaboration uh, with Walmart. We have 85% coverage of the top metro areas that will be closer to 90% by the end of the year. And we've demonstrated a 25% reduction in downstream medical costs um, through our network providers. Today, we offer um, CT and MRI as, as our imaging modalities. And by the end of the year, we'll be offering mammogram, cardiac spec, as well as PET scans. Now, in terms of how we actually identify providers for our network, we started with, um, as again, again, as I mentioned, that seven years of medical record and radiology information based on uh, over 10,000 unique patients. We also work in close partnership with a, an academic radiology group, um, the University Radiology Group, uh, that's associated with Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey, to develop a, what's really regarded now as the gold standard way uh, to assess radiology quality. And it's really through these two things that has enabled us to identify providers that meet a certain standard bar for us to include them in our network. And getting into some of the de details about how we do this, um, let's start by talking about the certification of our high-performing um, providers. We have built our statistical modeling and our algorithm to, uh, based on a number of different factors. One is diagnostic accuracy. We also look at the clinical relevance of errors because some errors are not necessarily clinically relevant. So there's a different weighting that we give to some errors versus others. And then we look at the correlation between accuracy and certain practice characteristics, such as the level of subspecialization, where providers went to medical school, what sort of training did they get, um, what sort of images have they looked at um, and have they specialized in within their practice. Uh, and we also look at the status of their equipment and the models of the machines that they actually have within their centers. Now, once we identify these providers, we don't just um, certify them and, uh, and just let it be. We have very much a close partnership with these providers um, that, that, uh, where we do ongoing quality monitoring and we provide feedback. So it is a, a very unique data sharing partnership in which they actually send us on a regular basis medical record information and radiology images for us to QA and then in return we actually give them feedback uh, to support um, process improvement and practice changes. And then the third component of our program is really following um, these patients and the outcomes over time. 
And as part of our program, when we work with employers, we have a guarantee against um, an improvement in outcomes and improvement in lower, lowering of costs. Here you'll see an example of a you know, so-called report card that we use to help radiology providers identify and address errors in the way that they are delivering care. So I want to share with you some of the outcomes uh, and the way that we've impacted um, the healthcare system. This first one is a case study from a Fortune 50 uh, employer involving 80,000 members. This was a prospective randomized study um, conducted over 16 months. This was an independent study. This was not done by us. Half of the members were sent to Covera Health uh, network providers, and the other half were routed to traditional providers within the traditional kind of health plan uh, network. And what was discovered over time was a 35% decrease in downstream medical costs. Uh, and again, this was done over 16 months. This is another study from a national insurance carrier uh, conducted nationally with uh, approximately 7,600 patients um, who received musculoskeletal or spine diagnostic MRIs. This was done over 12 months and um, it demonstrated a 25% reduction in medical claims costs with improvements in uh, utilization of, of services. And here you'll see the two largest categories of the savings uh, in, in terms of a breakdown were due to surgery and physical therapy um, with benefits also to the way that pharmacy products were used as well as uh, durable medical equipment. So one of the benefits of Covera is that Covera will integrate directly uh, into, um, the, I into the, the, the TPA. So uh, th this is sort of a, a typical uh, patient journey. The physician will order the radiology image. Uh, the physician's staff will then send a pre-authorization request to the utilization management vendor who's usually partnered with the health plan. And then the UM vendor will approve the request and the patient will automatically be routed to a Covera Health um, network provider. And in this way, the patient really uh, doesn't actually even really ever know the name Covera Health and there's no dis disruption to the patient journey. So finally, I, I want to talk briefly about opportunities um, for ERS of Texas and Covera Health to achieve uh, cost savings and improved outcomes. So you've had some uh, great news and outcomes. Um, you've achieved substantial savings with your new TPA. Um, but however, you have noted that your own costs and your member numbers are growing. So while you had kind of a, a dip and low utilization of your services, you've said that you're expecting those utilization levels to return to normal this year. Your retiree population has grown 173% in the last 20 years, and you have um, an older demographic within your member population. You've also said that a key driver of those increase in costs is chronic conditions. Um, things that are due to things like lifestyle factors such as obesity or smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. And, um, you know, a couple of your most expensive chronic medical conditions are back and joint pain, which are really high utilizers of radiology services. So. The management of these chronic condition, conditions often requires radiology imaging. Now, going back to the modalities that Covera Health currently, currently offers and will offer by the end of the year, um, these are all things that fit uh, and, and are, are highly relatable to your member population. Um, they're very applicable to uh, conditions like musculoskeletal issues, cancer, chronic pain, and heart disease. 
So again, these services are very relevant to um, ERS's populations as well as high cost areas. You've talked about um, and shown sort of the medical cost trend over time and that you expect that to sort of um, come back to normal levels this year. Uh, we, we feel that with Covera Health that we'll be able to help impact this trend line. And um, it's really because when members get the right care from the start of their healthcare journeys, those savings are really guaranteed and will impact those spending trends. So high quality care is correlated directly to better outcomes and lower costs. Now, in terms of how Covera Health uh, might be able to fit in with ERS's uh, value-based approach, you've talked about the success that you've had with your patient-centered medical home uh, program, that uh, those participants cost less than your non-medical home participants, and also that you require uh, referrals um, to be received, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be sent through in order for someone to receive in-network benefits. And that really fits very nicely into our own referral structure um, that integrates right with your, your TPA uh, and does not involve any added steps um, for your own members. Now, in terms of where we're headed, um, we are going to be evolving in ways that we believe could address ERS's uh, changing needs. We are building out a program in teleradiology we are being integrated into virtual healthcare plans, as well as um, forming relationships with other, other radiology networks um, that could fit very nicely into ERS's program. And uh, we'd be happy to speak to any of these in, in sort of a in more a confidential setting. Um, so finally, I want to bring it back to one of the first slides that I showed um, that are, is really taken directly from your annual report that a primary objective for your benefits program is to attract and retain a qualified workforce to serve the state of Texas, but to do it in a way um, where you get the most out of every dollar. So with Covera Health, you're going to be able to do this with, um, with our program. You'll be able to provide members the right care from the very start of their health care journey. Um, while also substantially reducing downstream costs. That's it. Thank you, Lena. We've got plenty of time for questions, so if you have any questions now, go ahead and, and just remember, speak up, please, please, please speak up. So we'll start with Diana. She's already got her hand raised. I do, because <laughs> I really enjoyed your presentation. Our opinions are probably still a lot of It was excellent. Thank you. The first one is, how do you get all those radiology slides that you show us? How, I mean, how, certainly people aren't sending them to you, and you're using more than the one lady who went to ten different places. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so we obtain the images through um, a system called DICOM and a, also a vendor that, is, um, that actually helps us with that. So it's actually, we integrate into each practice that we partner with through the contracting process, through the onboarding process, so that it just becomes a sort of a seamless way for them to share those images with us. So the ones that were not good, did they come that same route? The ones that were... They showed us that were not as good as the other when they signed us. Oh, yes. Well, not all of those were from our, our network providers. Those were, those were provided through our chief medical officer, uh, who is the director of, of, of imaging at uh, Hospital for Special Services in New York. So he, he from a, okay, I understand. Yeah. So my next question is, you talk about the, <clears throat> a large amount of misdiagnosis, which is a concern to everybody in this room. Um, but the stats you gave us were not specific to misdiagnosis and centered just radiology, right? I mean, that was misdiagnosis in general drives X percent. I know you said 50 percent of the malpractice suits could be attributed to radiology, but 
I just want to make sure we're all clear. Yes, sure. That all of this misdiagnosis is the result of radiology. Yes, correct. So I think that's a great point of clarification. Um, when we when we did our study with the one patient and the ten centers, you know we found a forty three percent diagnostic error rate. Now we recognize that that is just one patient; it's an n of one. It certainly doesn't represent everything that goes on in the u s. Um, if you take a look at the medical literature, there really is very little information about what that number might actually be. And so that's something that we're trying to clarify. Um, but you'll really see in the literature, Sometimes it's center-based, sometimes it's geography-based, but we've seen numbers anywhere from, you know, from really 10 percent to the 43 percent that we, that we demonstrated. So, uh, Bernie, can I ask a couple Yes, ma'am, you may. Because um, I'm on like everybody else. <laughs> uh, I know you mentioned that there are conflicting standards and quality control and measures for radiology, but there are measures. I would say, yeah, I would say that um, in terms of standards for quality, that there are, um, there are none that exist today that are truly reliable and based on data. There are ways to certify centers, right, which is usually done by the American College of Radiology. It's something that uh, most centers actually have that certification, but I would say that the um, uh, the bar is on the lower side, and certainly, um, again, it's really nothing that's based uh, rigorously on on data. So you have um, maybe I missed this. How many participating? So today we have 800 centers in our network. And by the end of the year, we'll have over 1,500. So those 800 today, and we have half a million participants, I'm trying to do the math here. Um, and I'm sure they're not all in Texas or every part of Texas. So I, I mean, it's just a comment for the group. I mean, there's a scope issue that would be an issue. But my last question is twofold. One, I'm wondering why you're not, or are you, I should ask you this way, are you contracting with carriers who would probably be very interested in working with you at some level to help build this? And number two, I'm interested in, without regard to quality, how your cost compares to average costs. Sure, so I'll address that. Um, great questions, thank you. The uh, first question is, we are absolutely interested in working with all the carriers. Um, again, moving from the workers' compensation business with all of this data and just coming into the benefits arena in the past year and a half. We were. We're not any longer. So what carriers are you working with? Today, Aetna, United, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arkansas. So those are the three we're integrated with, but we're anxious and we're having those conversations uh, every day. It's being led by large organizations like yourself to help with that dialogue and that's where the integration uh, points start. Because obviously when you have a owner service plan like ours that depends on in network referrals, it's, it's an important piece of the whole puzzle to have in network through the carrier. Yeah, absolutely. And the second part of your question is we don't um, get involved in negotiated rates at all. Uh, we are a mechanism to steer to high quality and don't get involved in that piece at all. Truly, our vision is to raise awareness about this problem that many people don't aren't talking about because employees aren't going to come and complain about it. They don't know. As a matter of fact, they might choose the center that had the quickest procedure and had the best coffee as their top choice and not know that 40 minutes was a better way to get a better outcome. So, so, so it's raising awareness in this and then raising quality across the board is our overall vision. So just one last personal comment. I can actually say that, you know, this has happened in my family. However, it was a case where an image from five years ago compared to an image today 
um, didn't quite show the same results among different providers, but the images were taken for different reasons. Hmm. And so I'm sure you run into that all the time. You know, something like that. The equipment from several years ago may still be there compared to maybe a new radiologist or all the various reasons we can all imagine certainly help drive this. That's a, it's a great a great point you make, and that's why part of joining this network, it's not a one-time distinction, it's a partnership where they're sending all of their DICOM images to us so we can continue to get smarter, and in turn, we're helping them get better. The high-quality centers that we've identified are so anxious for this. They are so thankful that somebody is looking at subspecialty, at equipment uh, quality, and at protocol adherence because they know they've been doing a great job and they haven't been getting that feedback or a way to distinguish themselves and set themselves apart. So they are thirsty for this information and are very willing to share all of those images with us. So hopefully the price is right. I know you don't get involved in that, but that's very important, no matter what we think. It, it is so important to us. Yeah, and I think one of the, um, the slides Lena had shown with some of the things we're looking at is partnering with other areas that have negotiated prices or other um, radiologist groups or um, imaging networks that might handle the price side of things. We are 100% exclusively focused on quality and getting foundationally the right diagnoses set for employees, patients. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a question? I've got a list. Okay, so the first one is, are your centers attached to hospitals or are they standalone centers? So it's a mixture. I would say that mo the majority of them are freestanding centers, but we do have uh, some that are tied with larger hospital systems. Okay, because I'm just thinking about the cost aspect of that. And then yeah. secondly, a lot of quality metrics are driven around unnecessary radiology that providers send for. Do you ever turn away people because you don't think they need the imaging or anything like that? No, I would say we, we don't get involved in that aspect of it. What we are getting involved with is there are provider practice patterns that where they're very used to sending somebody to a certain center, and they've been doing this for years. When we do send out that they shouldn't go to that center anymore or that doctor on that machine really should not be reading this, that's where we get some feedback or pushback from the provider community. And inside of our... Um, inside of our technology, we're making it a little more difficult to, than to just check a medical exception box and really rather make them say why they shouldn't go to this quality center. It's an easy place for us to be because we're not, we're agnostic to price. We're truly just hoping to get them to the, the best center. Right, because I would think sometimes maybe you'll get a patient that comes in for a MRI of their knee, let's just say. I was just thinking, would you possibly downgrade that to a CT because it doesn't really need an MRI, which I know you're not involved in the price, but ultimately would cost ERS more money. We, we don't get involved with that sort of initial referral, but through time with the feedback that we provide to each center, they would be able to, you know, to, to learn insights like that, um, which they can then in turn share with their referring providers. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I'll just, I'll just add on to that if sure. I could real quick. Um, there's two things we're also looking at, which is um, we'd be interested in, in your feedback on this specifically, is secondary authorization processes. If there's any of those, we find those to be effective as well in terms of making sure that the person um, needs it. And then secondarily is second opinion programs through teleradiology, that if some reason, because of network adequacy, if there was too far to travel, if it was going to potentially a lower quality center, potentially having a second opinion read that MRI each and every time is another area where teleradiology is looking into ensuring quality is brought to the forefront. Right, right, makes sense. So then my last question is, I know you mentioned that you saved approximately 25% of the patient's care. How do you get all the other claims that go with that episode besides just the radiology claim? Yeah, that's, that's it's a great question. And so we will look to actuary partners in that specific example that was run by a third party in Mercer in running those outside who had access to all the claims data. It was not a test that we ran ourselves. Okay, thanks 
Um, so what is the cost to ERS and do you guys offer any sort of guarantee? So the answer to that is yes. And so we'd have to work closely with the, the, the health plan to determine what levels of integration would be needed since we're not integrated at this point before coming up with that, uh, an exact cost. Um, in terms of the second part of your question was, I missed. You offer guarantees. guarantees. We do, we do. So we are willing to put, we need a three, we look for three year contract with everybody. And the reason being is there is a ROI that happens within the first year but the greater savings starts to materialize in six months 16, 17, and 18, and we want to make sure that that program goes through, and we're willing to put our fees at risk for that in a value-based um, solution. Tell us about how early you Sure. So the company really started as an entity called Spremo Health, which, um, as Frank alluded to, we used to work in, in occupational medicine. And that was really where we got that seven years of all that, that patient data that was so helpful to us. And um, within the last year, um, Covera Health was actually spun off of Spremo Health. And what we did was we retained um, all of the data analytics and the, the modeling and the algorithms um, behind you know, the, the way that we can identify centers. Um, Covera Health itself has raised about $8 million uh, so far in a, in a Series A funding. So it's really a year old. It, it, it is a, as, a, as Covera, it is. As Covera. And I would also just add to that from a financial standpoint, it's cash flow positive at this moment. Um, so it, there's not a plan for further raising. There's a plan now to scale because the network really across the country has been built and the inbounds are coming from providers who would like to continue to join or see what they need to do to join the network. So just to clarify, the seven years of data is based on what Occupational medicine. And now, and for the past year, Yes, but the but the you know the interesting thing about occupational medicine was that what it enabled us to do was to follow patients from start to finish, because we were able to you know get uh, get their information from the very beginning of their care and follow them through every step of the way, and it was and it was really what we felt was such a unique way to get access to data and as well as outcomes. And and, and the reason we we moved over was a customer asked us to. They said, let's not only have this happening after the fact, how do we get out in front of this and make this part of our benefit plan design? So we start sending people to right centers. That, that customer had um, incidents of uh, two surgeries that were unnecessary on, and folks never came back to work. So they were looking at this data we were having and saying, we need to get this not just in work-related injuries, but into benefits. And that's when we got out of the workers' compensation business and as part of the sale of that company retained all the data and the DICOM images and now we're getting, continuing, as this network's been built across the country, all the additional images. So if our carrier said, uh, our network said, um, yeah, we would like to contract, who do they contract with if you want to negotiate with us? So they would contract, we would sit down in a room together and just kind of figure out how the program would work. They would contract directly with us on a, uh, for a network access fee, and we would get in batch file all of the pre-authorizations for the employees here every night, and then we would send out the steerage at that point. So we're not going to negotiate. We'll leave that to the TPA to negotiate all the rates and with each with, that they already have in place. So it would always be an in-network doctor. We start there, right? We start with in-network doctors and just steer to quality within the network currently. So you look at our current in-network. We do. That is correct. Yeah, and, and then within that, we look at how far would you want somebody to drive to get to there? Would it be 15 miles, 20 miles? And then we lean back on the rest of the health plan's network, um, for the TPA's network, to fill in the gaps if it falls outside of that. And that's where things like second opinion or we work together and, and potentially could build out the network or work with the plan to raise the quality bar across. So if a physician didn't want to steer to a certain provider, I mean, we have a sponsor of the state, it's steered within the run, right? So I'm trying to figure out, I, I assume we can do it without steering. 
Well, there are ways for, for referring physicians to identify medical exceptions, and they, they then are then free to refer to whichever center they prefer. So by exception? By exception. By exception. Correct. Just out of curiosity, what's your presence like here in the state of it's, it's strong. The first customer was Walmart, so it's built on the, that backbone. So you can recognize wherever there's Walmart stores in the rural areas, it's been built out. We have a, um, a list of other customers coming on board that are, are, are driving the uh, build out in the cities, which is a little bit easier for us to identify high quality providers inside the cities. And we can go deeper with you um, in this, the network inside of the state at any point. Providers. It's a combination. It's a combination. Find a center that has five really good radiologists and five that are bad. That's been interesting conversations, <laughs> as you can imagine, where we're letting them know that these these doc physicians should no longer be doing at least these body parts on these machines, and it's data backing that up. So, as you can imagine, it can be uncomfortable conversations that we've had to have with some of these centers. But in general, the centers that have the 10 really good physicians and the great equipment and have some good protocols are so thankful that we're having the dialogue because they're saying, I knew we were better than the center down the street. Um, now I have a way to kind of prove it. And I think what we're finding is that there's been actually a level of discomfort that some radiologists have had with doing, you know, reading exams and interpreting exams that they don't feel confident in. So this is actually helping to focus them on what they're good at. Yeah, it's a great question, and we have had to do that. Um, even, you know, partially uh, decertify centers where certain doctors couldn't be participate in this. So. The feedback loop on that is ongoing with the providers. We're sending quarterly reports to them and doing an account management review with them as to how exactly they're holding up their quality standards and give them all the reporting on how we feel they scored from a data perspective on their results in this past quarter. And so they're, they're thirsty for that and they're also pushing back. So we're not saying we have the, all the answers. We're saying here's what the data is pointing us to. With an 86% confidence, we would say that you've hit this one perfectly, but you might look for this, this, or this. Combination of both. Do you do you include this? Does anybody include this as part of the credentialing process? No, but um, I can say that we sort we are we are working on something a little bit more. Um, official and formalized, uh, it's something that we can discuss in more a confidential setting. As part of the feedback that you're giving to the centers, are you providing feedback? Because I remember correctly, your number one which was the quality of the image. Do you provide feedback on their machines and their equipment? Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's th that's yes, that's right. So there are bodies like the American College of Radiology that will so-called certify centers, um, but the list of criteria are are fairly minimal, and they're not based on quality, and certainly not based on um, you know uh, d different different data sets. Well, there's practice standards too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I, I would, yes, that's I would, right. I would add on top of that, even though the order might have said one, two, three, um, it's, it varies which one's most um, a, a responsible for the results. We found subspecialty to be extremely important inside of the data, and then the protocol adherence is really important. You can have the right technician and the right equipment, and if you're trying, because of fee-for-service pressure, you're graded on getting a number of them done in a day, you might take that 15-minute a window versus the 40 minute window on a lower back MRI. And it's just a shortcut that pressure of fee for service. If, if there's no feedback loop and nobody's holding you accountable and it's, you're moving yourself into a commodity, that can end up being an issue. So even with the equipment 
and the right technician, uh, protocol adherence is also critical. Yeah. So that that happens almost immediately. There's really it's, there's no difference between getting referred to a non Covera center versus, you know, versus one of our our centers. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. That's so then, do you have some type of training for the nurses at the payers, or how does that process work? I I the doctor call in and say I need a pre op for an MRI. What does the nurse, how does the nurse on the other end of the phone know what to do? Yeah, so we, we, have a, we have a customer success team that works with each center to help get them up and running, and that's part of the process. Because there are a lot of, as you know, practice patterns of right. sending, yeah. and you can almost see where the mouse is clicked and the yellow sticky is sent here for every MRI. And so when they get that bounce back working with the UM vendors, a bounce back will come and say, are you sure you want to override this and send this to this center? It's been recommended not to. And, and so it's breaking in through some of those practice patterns. And we're, um, we're training those centers on, on how to work with us on that. Yeah, I would be curious, and this would be a conversation probably for Diana and you and myself, to talk about which providers might look like they're highest in quality, but maybe are also highest in cost. Well, that, that kind of brings me back to, I mean, actual cost is one thing, but right. to Michelle's question, up there, can you at least give us a range? I mean, do you bill on a PM PM? Do you bill by referral? And then kind of give us a range? Yeah, it's a, a PM PM basis. A PM PM. A, a range would be between a dollar and a dollar and a quarter. And again, we would be willing to put that at risk. If it wasn't just an, um, a return on the investment, it was a, a positive return on the investment. So if there aren't any other questions, I would just um, uh, encourage you to read the article that was just published today by a reporter in the Kaiser Health News. Um, what he does is he actually, uh, you know, we, we weren't involved in the, in the writing of that article. Um, but he actually interviews a number of thought leaders in radiology where they've uh, just highlighted some of the key issues um, that I think are fairly relevant to, uh, to this area. Last chance for any questions. One more. Go ahead. Centers of excellence referral that you say have misdiagnosed? Did they use in your illustration? Are they still centers of excellence for that? Which which center of excellence were you referring to? It's in one of your early slides. It's one of your examples. Yeah. Um, uh, you don't have to answer it, Robert. No, we're not. Okay. I'm just curious if the centers of excellence can be good. Are you maybe referring to one of the comments that came from one of our employers where, um, you know, they've noticed that about half of the Patients that get sent. Well, I think what what we're hearing from a lot of employers, uh, like Walmart, is that when they um, have their employees, their associates sent to uh, uh, their own surgical centers of excellence. <laughs> that the patients are flown out there and uh, they have the images redone and the physicians there at that center realize that the images and the interpretations that were done uh, at the beginning were, were not accurate. Well, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. We have, we have time for one more question if anybody got one. Okay. Thank you very much Thank for you your time much. today. I'll wrap it up here so you can stay seated. Okay. Yeah, this concludes today's solution session. I want to thank Lena and, and Frank for being here today and representing Covera Health and, and giving this presentation. To those of you here uh, in, in person and those of you tuning in online, thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.